I think Estonians are really, really good at, um, oddly enough, working together. So we <laughs> we think that we're Go very, <laughs> yeah, we think that we're very uh, kind of closed and insular and angry people. But I don't think we are. <laughs> Welcome to this podcast created by the Estonia Briefing Center. In this series, we invite some of the most influential people in politics and business to discuss all angles of digitalization in Estonia and the world. From past learnings to current challenges and future plans. So take a seat, pour yourself a glass of your favorite drink and enjoy the art of digitalization. Well, hello and welcome to this latest edition of The Art of Digitalization. Today, I have with me the CEO and co-founder of FIMA, Karen K. Burns, and we're going to have a fantastic chat about uh, digitalization, AI, um, all kinds of ethical questions connected to this, and much, much more. Uh, Karen, uh, thank you so much for being with us. How are you today? I'm good, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. It's very nice to have you here in a physical setting as well. Of course, we are socially distanced, but uh, it is nice to have a physical interview for a change as well. And we hope that this year we will have more and more over time also. Um, I guess the first question would be, um, to get into the topic, uh, can you tell me more about what FIMA does um, and uh, who does it cater to? What are the, what are the use cases and so on? Mm -hmm. So we are a computer vision AI company and we take in real-time video streams from cameras and our AI kind of AI brain looks at those video streams and turns everything it sees into data. So you could use this indoors, outdoors, anywhere there's a camera and you need to collect data at scale from a physical environment. The good thing is that it scales quite quickly because mm. most of the world is already covered with cameras. Yeah, true. Yeah. And then most of the video streams come in a specific standard. So, so we work with um, basically any video stream out there. Um, and it's a self-service platform. So there's three kind of things that set us apart from competition. One is it's a self-serve uh, platform. So you can basically create an account, log on, set your stream up, everything in under 30 seconds per camera and start getting data back immediately. So that's something that we haven't seen competition do yet. Second thing is completely hardware uh, free. So we don't mm -hmm. come in with any installations. Uh, there's no need for IoT devices. Just whatever camera you have, we'll, we'll use that. And the third thing is uh, GDPR safety. So even on our, our algorithms are trained on anonymized data. So mm -hmm. the algorithms don't see people's faces or biometric features. And we have also been in discussions with Estonian Data Protection Inspectorate or AKI, Aki, uh, before we launch any features to actually make sure that we are in fact GDPR compliant and we're not infringing on anyone's privacy and security because we you know, still want to use the data in a, in a good way um, and, and not uh, infringe on, on people's privacy or, or security. And I guess the, the aspect of the GDPR also makes sense, not just because you've got uh, plenty of European markets that will be open, open for you in general, but also because we see other uh, non-EU countries um, uh, applying very similar legislation to, to be in accordance with the uh, GDPR. Um, Canada comes to mind, Argentina, so around the, the world. The so I UK. think that's a, yeah. And the UK, of course. Uh, greetings to our Brits, uh, wherever you're listening from. So that's, that's, I think, a very, very smart idea. Um, I know a bit more about your, uh, about your professional career and, and your development. And uh, one thing that struck me was that I think you did some work in the filming industry as well. And I was wondering, can you tell us more about your career development and whether your experience with, with all of these different uh, industries informed your idea to create FIMA and to go in this direction with AI? You say, uh, yeah, when startups talk about pivots, I've done a, a fair few in my own life as well. Yeah. So I left the study when I was 18, back in 2005. Um, and I really wanted to work in film and TV. Like that was my dream. I wanted to be a Hollywood producer, went to the UK, went to film school. Uh, but I ended up working in IT immediately. So for British Telecom and then for the United Kingdom's health and social care regulation 
ICT team and so forth to pay for my studies and my living costs because mm-hmm. London is extortionate. You know, there are cheaper places in the world. That's <laughs> exactly. Fair, yeah. And I had to pay for my own studies as I was kind of conducting them. So I paid for my master's as a uh, every semester, I think. So I'm quite proud to have been able to come out of uni with no debt, essentially. However, um, so I worked in IT, I loved it. Um, I think everything I still use today in terms of strategic kind of thinking, financial management, um, all that stuff was trained into me in the UK. Um, they put me through like Prince2, Etil, Scrum, all sorts of training. And I was in charge of a 15 million pound operational budget at the age of 21. So a lot of responsibility um, and a brilliant job. But I'm still in touch with my old boss, actually. Hi, yeah. Paul, if you're out there. <laughs> he retired uh, recently, but uh, we're kind of pen pals. Um, and then I ended up in uh, South Africa for a very short time uh, as a white woman. I didn't do anything else but play golf and really badly and <laughs> horse ride really badly. Um, and then we moved to the Middle East because it felt safer. <laughs> that does make sense. Yeah. Um, and then that's the first place where I actually first um, made the decision that, right, um, I'll, I'll try this film and film thing here, finally. Yeah. Because there wasn't that, that many kind of IT jobs around in, in Dubai. And I ended up working for the Abu Dhabi government, Media Zone Authority, pitching the desert to Hollywood and Bollywood, actually, studios. Um, and every time a movie came in, I would then flip into the production office and work in the production office doing kind of contract finance, uh, negotiating deals with hotels and so forth. And uh, I was the uh, in the team that got, in Fast Furious 7, Star Wars 7, uh, Beware the Night, uh, which now I think is Deliver Us from Evil. They can change the working title halfway through. There um, are some desert scenes there, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. AFCO was actually the name of Star Wars when it came in. So yeah. a lot of them have these working titles that yeah. uh, are used. And I absolutely hated it. Like working on Star Wars 7 was the worst. I didn't even stay for the shoot. <laughs> I left before. I came back to Estonia and kind of had one of those a year off life moment where I tried to figure out what to do next mm. and then pivoted into uh, back into IT actually went to work yeah. for Moon Cascade as everybody I think in Estonia knows Garage 48 and mm-hmm. one of the founders Preet Saloma so uh, he took a chance with me so I was their first business development person and it's something I really 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 enjoyed so I could utilize my network my love of people and talking lots um, technology as well <laughs> technology so, yeah. exactly yeah, that's good mix. Um, and that's where I met Davi my current co-founder so uh, we clicked really well we worked really well together it's mm. a complementing uh, skill set so he's been building ai teams for the past i think eight years now actually across the nordics and i'm the more um, sales finance person so yeah. so these skill sets match really well and we kind of started thinking straight away we should set up a company together and we're very actively seeking ways in which to do that mm. so after two years with moon cascade um he set up a consultancy arm i had a baby uh, and then we kind of met back up in 2000 and 2020 is it what year is it 2021 yeah so we met up actually (laughs) (laughs) uh it is the 19 october Mm -hmm. and launched the advisory which is now fima yeah so which has also obviously gone through a pivot so we raised money for actually a very different type of company uh for a qa tool for computer vision teams or kind of ai teams within Mm -hmm. companies realized quickly there's not much market for that and then pivoted into the cameras Mm -hmm. um Talking about the cameras, uh, obviously we want to um, sort of bridge the gap between very deep technological topics and uh, and sharing the the experience and how it works with the, with the wider masses. So the question, I guess, is how do you actually turn regular dumb cameras, so to speak, into smart sensors? What's the what's the technology behind that? Mm-hmm. So, uh, each camera, in a way, already is actually. A- a sensor True. they have yeah. an you know ip address often and so forth um and then the the turning happens through taking the, the stream looking at it and, and giving back that actionable data so mm-hmm. there are already cameras out there that do the analytics on device mm-hmm. or on the camera side and give that out um the tech is getting better but then the clients will have to kind of put their money all into that one uh, manufacturers um, you've got vendor lock in immediately exactly yeah, yeah. And, and that's what we're trying to get away from and then often, often the vendor lock in also comes with more money lock in so okay yeah. you buy the kit then you uh, have to pay for the analytics for all of the extra analytics you want to get out mm. of it you still probably need an AI team or some sort of a team to analyze this so it's something that we want to kind of be able to offer the clients um, 
in a completely self-set up way. It should be so easy. You know, we in Estonia, we talk about this handyman in your pocket. Yeah. So AI should be like this invisible handyman in your pocket. Set it up, it runs, and, and you just work with the actionable insights you're yeah. able to get out. So yeah. that's the kind of smartness around it. So um, can you maybe give us a small idea? I mean, I'm sure there are people listening that that uh, think, oh, maybe this is applicable for my business or uh, my area as well. Can you tell us more about the, the cost or business model behind this? So would mm -hmm. it be like per device or how, how, do you, how do you work that? So we charge per device mm -hmm. per month. So and then that includes 10 features. So uh, again, rather than do these really complicated packages, um, you basically set up an account, onboard the camera, and then that's it. And we're charging um, 150 euros mm -hmm. per camera per month. So really simple to understand. You can budget immediately, you'll know what it will cost. Yeah. And we mostly kind of, at the moment, the main effort is going into working with um, uh, retail centers, shopping centers, business parks. Mm -hmm. Actually, where we are right now, Lamista. So yes. yeah. we have analytics cameras up here to understand how people are using the space, are there any safety issues and so forth. Um, and in shopping malls as well, who comes in? how much time they spend here and so forth. So at the moment, shops are doing this through uh, uh, brake beam infrared sensors, mm -hmm. IO, lots of IoT cameras, Wi-Fi Mac address trackers, 3D cameras, uh, AI cameras. Like there's so much sensor technology that goes in uh, and we can just replace all of that. And then by by having AI look at the camera. And those things. clients would still have to piece everything together afterwards anyway. So um, yeah, yeah even, exactly. even if we ignore the easier setup, um, there would be a, quite a lot of work connected to that. Uh, if I remember correctly, you, you did some work with a shopping center uh, on a particular topic, uh, namely how satisfied the uh, customers came in and went out. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that? Oh yeah, that was part of the consultancy company before we pivoted into a yeah. product. Uh, it was around the motion detection. Um, and it just goes to show how difficult that area is. Yeah. So people would come in and leave with the same face, even if they'd done a purchase. So you, we couldn't really tell anything about their happiness yeah. levels. Would you would you say that that's due to Estonians being Estonians, and maybe in Spain or Italy you might have had bigger success with that with that idea? Or <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the Spanish are so happy they walk in happy and they walk <laughs> out just as happy. So I don't know, but I think it's, it's really hard to kind of glean emotion just from from facial expression. But I think it's also good to to see how how quickly and agile you can be in pivoting and uh, and redirecting your your business model and and focus. So that's that's I think very good. Um, whenever we talk about AI and particular uh, camera surveillance, um, I guess one of the one of the big questions that pops up in most people's head is is the the ethical question. Um, How do I make sure, uh, you know, that I'm I'm being watched anonymized? Uh, where is my data stored and so on? Can you maybe tell us more about that? Mm -hmm. So we do not store any data at all. So any of the video, none of the video stream we look at, uh, Fima doesn't store it. So if you can imagine, I had to explain this to a non-technical person the other day. So if you imagine the video stream like a waterfall mm -hmm. and we're like this little, little net or like a sieve that this waterfall Uh, goes through and we only capture the debris in there so we only capture these pieces of information yeah. everything gets thrown away immediately mm -hmm. um, so all we kind of retain or give out to the customers is a number that's it so yeah. how many people how many cars buses trucks trams e-bikes whatever um, and, and that's that the stuff that comes out everything's anonymized uh, before we train the algorithms and we have had lawyers with us since august last year mm -hmm. analyzing the platform making sure that it is gdpr compliant uh, we adhere to iso standards iska standards and um, we updated our website we actually launched a new website a week ago there's a special section just for that so visit under a, pardon visit under fiverr.ai there and there's it. a yep. gdpr section so if you're a data protection officer You can basically refer to that page and, and yeah. get the information that you need. So it's also self-service GDPR protection, effectively. Basically, Very nice. yes. Um, what about, and I, I, this, this ties into a much wider topic uh, when, we're, when we're talking about um, technology firms cooperating with uh, other countries around the world. Uh, what sort of ethical boundaries do you have in terms of cooperating with, with other countries? Uh, we have, uh, in the EU, we have different kinds of weapons bans uh, for, for authoritarian states or, or uh, countries with civil wars or anything like that. Um, what, what are the standards that you um, opt into voluntarily as FIMA? And maybe also a bit of an opinion on whether there should be an international 
international or at least a national standard for this kind of stuff? Yeah, so we don't work with sanctioned countries at all. We mm-hmm. had we didn't even take money from those countries uh, when we were fundraising. So that was a very clear kind of line we drew in the sand. So clean investor money. Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so no Chinese money, even if it came through like American investors. Uh, mm-hmm. So we we did our due diligence in that and didn't take any of that money in. Um, and we have actually said no to a, like the recent one was a really big French client who was going to use the tech in a way that we found uncomfortable. It was within the legal framework, but just something that would that have been technically possible, but if he from the say, outside, yeah. it would have been legally possible as well. It just <clears throat> wasn't ethical. So, yeah. so we kind of refused to cooperate with them further. So it, it is something that we kind of maintain and, and are building into our, our culture as mm. well. That That's something that we don't want to do. Yeah. And whether there should be a standard or not, it's kind of a hard one. So should Twitter have banned, you know, Trump? Uh, yeah. Yes or no? It's kind of odd when a private company does that and then maybe doesn't ban, ban other people from their platform. Sanctioned countries are sanctioned anyway. So mm-hmm. we kind of follow international guidelines as it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is true. It's uh, There's a lot of responsibility in the hands of private corporations these days. So I, th- I think these um, ethical guidelines that you, even, even if you set them up yourself, uh, just just for how you want to run your company. I think that's uh, incredibly uh, valuable. Um, I want to talk a bit more about about the the uh, human side of AI and how humans feel about all of this robotics and machine learning stuff and so on. Um, why do you think many people are, many people are skeptical of technology or uh, even if they are open minded uh, have an easier time imagining the downsides rather than the upsides so like even if you have an open minded person that rather says oh we have to be careful about x y z rather than saying oh interesting we can have the gains 1 2 3 mm-hmm. why do you think that is cuz there was a meme yesterday i read and again i think twitter were um uh, the Tesla says, I'll take all your data. People are like, yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll pay you for it as well. And yeah. then with other companies, they're like, how dare you touch that? Yeah. Um, uh, however, um, uh, people don't understand AI, I mm. think is the, the kind of broad claim I'm bold, you know, I'm quite boldly making right now. Uh, so artificial intelligence has been covered in um, books, films, you know, mm. since the, the, dawn of, of movies and mostly essentially. incorrectly <laughs> and mostly yeah, it, not even incorrectly it didn't exist exist back then yeah. but it, it's just been a bit of a dreamscape and something to kind of uh, let your imagination run riot with mm-hmm. and, and now that we actually have it then we can work with it those myths that ai might be something bad uh, are still with us yeah. and, and kind of stopping us from harnessing uh, the ways it could be you know it could be good for us. Mm. I think we're a little bit stuck in, in that kind of thinking. Also, uh, people do very, like we're in the shallow uh, short-termism, I guess. So people mm. read, uh, skim read things. They don't go deep into kind of technical papers or how stuff works. So if they've read something around machine learning, training and models, uh, you know, they might already throw out stuff that, uh, you know, isn't really correct but uh, yeah. makes them assume stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's just one of those fields that's really muddy and it's complicated more by actually a lot of uh, technical companies who say, oh, we use AI, we utilize this, that. And what they really do is they don't have any proprietary IP and yeah. they're just using open source frameworks. Yeah. So one of the first jobs we did actually was to validate uh, for a Norwegian uh, VC company whether a, co- whether a startup actually has uh, AI-related IP or not. Yeah. I think that the statistic was something like uh, out of eight companies, three had. Mm-hmm. So you can see the ratio there. I, I, th- I think, uh, yeah, th- I remember when, when uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, and uh, in particular Bitcoin blew up, uh, and uh, any company that would put uh, crypto or Bitcoin into, into their company name would all immediately see their stocks rise uh, several times over. So, yeah. Um, I, th- I think we're living in a data in a world of data abundance rather than scarcity as it yeah. was maybe a hundred years ago and as a result uh, we need to be taught new skills rather than learning how to read well, we should we should still learn how to read but we should also learn how to filter uh, the information that we receive um, absolutely um, talking about this sort of disconnect between what AI can do and what people think 
it can do. I guess one of the issues is also that an AI is, at the end of the day, a black box that sort of spits out a result. Um, so ev even for those that developed it, uh, it's not necessarily 100% comprehensible where that decision came from. Mm -hmm. um, but how can we explain technology better to people? Uh, it's not just about teaching them how to program. It's, I guess it's also about public communication overall. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we make the topic less scary? Um, just by bringing it out more, yeah. out, out into the open a lot more. Um, so just to kind of maybe add on to my previous response, so there's a bit of a cliff that we've seen with our clients. There are those who are very um, much... A, you know, so far from digitalization mm -hmm. that AI is, is not too much of a leap. Yeah. And then there's those ones who are very AI ready, understand it, um, you know, understand how they can apply it. But but it's a big gap. So there's not really a trend. Yeah. Um, and what we are trying to do to demystify it and get it out more into the open is by having, you know, podcasts like we're having right now. True. I was on a panel yesterday uh in a latvian acceleration uh, program uh, we are building something onto our website which will uh this kind of have like these explainer animation videos mm -hmm. that actually explain also in the technical level how the platform works yeah. what it does how it's trained how it kind of thinks within that black box yeah um we're um annotating images actually within the team mm -hmm. so we have data scientists send us little packages and then we annotate them so we can understand you know what kind Translate. of data yeah, yeah it actually is learning from yeah um and then uh, that kind of uh, can, can also be made into a game for example mm -hmm. so that's something that uh, we discussed today actually what if we had a game on our website where people can just come and, and annotate stuff yeah I think this, uh, the, yeah, there are several aspects of, of this education path, whether it's games or videos or a uh, tiny shout out to the University of Tartu, this AI basic course uh, that was yeah. offered. Um, I'm a political scientist. I'm uh, partially ashamed to say I'm not a programmer. I don't have an IT background. Uh, but for me, that was one of the ways to understand actually how does AI How do you set up an AI? You know, how does machine learning actually work with all the different steps? So um, I think we we can all learn uh, either to communicate better uh, or to learn uh, better as well. Um, one question that is also connected to FIMA uh, and and how you've pivoted or perhaps have not pivoted. Um, did COVID change your business model at all or the kinds of clients that you were looking for? Or um, do you feel like that uh, will remain similar over the next few years as well? So it didn't change the business model, but mm -hmm. it did change the kind of clients we were going after. Yeah. Um, so we kind of started uh, in, a, in a weird way where we started from the tech Mm -hmm. And then we're looking for the best use case for this tech. Yeah. So what's the shortest kind of time to value for us? So 2020, we mostly spent just testing this technology out. So we tried car parks, urban environments, retail centers, mm. city governments. We did the analytics for Tartu, Auto Vabadus, Puyeste, or Car Free uh, Ali, for yeah. example. Um, and then just kind of tried to iterate around it. And what happened with COVID, we were actually in Dubai, Uh, in the Road and Transport Authority, um, kind of in the middle of a project, actually, as part of an acceleration program. And that's when we were thinking traffic, urban, that's our kind of path. Yeah, we're going to go and niche. do that. Yeah. And then COVID happened and every public sector client was kind of, oh my God, we have to learn how to work from home, go remote, shut stuff down. Like this is way like too much. Yeah. So everybody kind of... Um, went into this overdrive about what to do next crisis management mode yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. um we've we've seen obviously we've got uh, to the dear listeners um we've got obviously many great it companies in estonia pharma being one of them uh and uh, many were expecting that uh, perhaps covid would immediately lead to this big push from from governments around the world saying oh we need this technology now but rather what's happened is uh, patchwork solutions right now just to sort of get the worst stuff out of the way uh, but i still do think that over the next uh, year or two uh, that then the, co uh, the the countries will realize okay well we've we've settled this issue for now uh, and now we can think about more more fundamental digitalization uh, also in areas connected to what FIMA does so yeah. i think uh, yeah we still have to be a bit more patient uh, perhaps but uh, but it will come out uh, quite it, well at the end yeah but it, i mean did, it did make us really 
push away from those types yeah. of clients because we realized that B2G traffic, we can't be in that in, in that space. Mm-hmm. And so it, that that's what kind of actually did push us more yeah. towards the retail and, and business park space. Yeah. And they, they will come back in one shape or form. I'm quite quite confident. Um one of the uh, one of the last questions that I have for you uh, was, um, and it's not connected to to what you do, but rather to your role as an Estonian citizen. Um, I guess my question was, and I, I like to ask this several people, uh, whoever I meet, effectively, what is your favorite digital service to use in Estonia? Sort of a government service or anything that uh, that you think, especially in comparison to the rest of the world, perhaps is is quite useful and that you would wish for the rest of the world as well. Digital signature. I can use it every day. And mobile ID or smart yeah. ID, whichever I use, but just the way able to digitally sign stuff. Yeah. Uh, and also the um, uh, tax filing service. The tax because having yeah. lived in the UK, <laughs> having <laughs> had done it on paper and then waiting for that yellow check in the post that you have to tear off and yeah. take, oh my God, probably doesn't happen like that anymore, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I I think I still have a checkbook, so, yeah. I moved to the UK in 2011, and when I opened my first bank account with HSBC, they gave me a card, uh, begrudgingly, but they also gave me a checkbook, which I did not touch a single time. So, uh, greetings to, to our friends across the smaller pond. Um, yeah, I, just as an explanation, perhaps, so mobile ID, smart ID are different ways of authenticating yourself uh, in, in Estonia. Uh, both are connected to your mobile phone. One is a SIM card and one is an app and you can find all uh, everything about that uh, uh, on our website as well so yeah i think the tax declaration is actually a, a big big winner uh, and it's been around for 20 years now in estonia yeah. so uh, time time does fly uh, last but not least um one final question um it's a, it's a two-part i guess uh, number one what can we learn from the world in the area of of technology and digitalization where is estonia perhaps still lagging behind a small bit uh, and also what is the the number one thing that you would want uh, to be shared with the world more widely uh, whether it's agile thinking or just do it attitude or anything else mm-hmm. i think the first part of the question i would now say that Estonia has kind of become a victim of its own success. Mm. So we've become um, a bit slow and lazy now that all of that stuff was pushed out. And then yeah. we still think we're top of the world. We we, we still are in many mm. of these digitalization aspects, but everybody else is catching up. Yeah. So we should really, you know, like in a race, uh, this is the moment where I think we should kind of look around and think, will we still win it? Are we still... The, the, get a second wind yeah 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 mm-hmm. so, so that's something i think we need to kind of look at and there should be better leadership coming from um i think the government on this and then actually to kind of push this up g- the agenda a little bit more yeah. um and what to learn from the world uh what, what the world can learn from us the, other way. Of the, mm-hmm. the one message that you would share i think the estonians are really really good at um Oddly enough, working together. So we <laughs> we think that we're very <laughs> yeah we think that we're very uh, kind of closed and insular and angry people. But I don't think we are, and that's what you can see from how a lot of small businesses to work together. How COVID kind of elevated everybody mm-hmm. in, into kind of let, let's try and help each other. All these initiatives popped up. Uh, I mean, we are the land of unicorns. I think we're lagging behind Israel a bit, but that term depends actually on how you term yep. uh, the unicorn. Um, so, and, and none of that would happen unless there was really good open uh, collaboration uh, towards success. So yeah. we don't kind of beat about the bush. We we kind of set set a goal and then we move towards it. It's pretty direct communication uh, in Estonia as well. And I think this this sort of startup ecosystem, this uh, open friendly mindset, is is very helpful. Uh, indeed um uh, about your first remarks about the sort of uh, lack of innovation or like the, sort of the running out of steam in a way i guess it is challenging because uh, when you have 99 percent of government services online uh some more user-friendly than others absolutely but uh you know you're sort of more or less done um or at least that's what it feels like where do you go next so it's it's really tricky uh, what about uh, education so that's my point education covid we this could have been a brilliant case yeah to we're such a small country Mm. like with e-voting i was still living in the uk and i remember colleagues telling me 
guys, you're 1.2 million people. You're a pilot project. Do it for 10 years and the yeah. rest of the world will tend th- then take notice. And that's yeah. what happened. Yeah. True. So again, this is something that we, we could do now. Digital classrooms, um, you know, using people who are maybe out of work to come in and teach certain topics mm-hmm. at, and then just kind of iterate and be agile around that and more personal yeah. in terms of education as well. So my older child has a speech impediment and she's in a kind of special class. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of t- to to be more flexible, uh, we're not all same kind of neurological type. True. Um, and I think digital education and, and kind of more remote learning could cater or help cater yeah. for a lot more different types of, of people. Because again, my one of my friends... Uh, her daughter's grades shot up from uh, C's to full A's mm-hmm. because she was able to now manage her own time. Yeah. Just by being on a remote learning it's thing. It's all different learning styles. Yeah, that is true. And uh, a flexible system should should be able to account for that. Uh, well, uh, Karen, it's been an ex- absolute pleasure uh, to have you here to talk about uh, AI, what FIMA does, uh, ethical questions and digitalization in Estonia. Um, uh, to the dear listeners uh, back at home, in the office and on the road, I hope you had a good time and we're looking forward to hearing you again next time. Thank you very much. Have a good day, evening, morning. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye. And that's the end of yet another thought-provoking conversation about the art of digitalization. In the meantime, make sure to stay connected with eEstonia on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. You can also check out our website e-estonia.com to learn more about digitalization in this beautiful country and other upcoming events. For now, that is all from our side. Stay tuned for our next podcast episode and have a great day. Thank you.